Nicholas Copernicus, named after his father, was born in 1473 in Turun, Poland. He was the youngest of four children. Early records of his father state that he was a wealthy merchant specialising in copper, who later was deeply involved in politics. His mother, Barbara, was part of the highly powerful Watson Road family. Their ties through marriages linked Nicholas to many wealthy and noble families within the region. When Nicholas was only 10 years old, his father died. However, his maternal uncle, Lucas Watsonrode the Younger, took young Nicholas into his care and saw to his education and career. Lucas Watsonrode the Younger was himself quite an interesting character. He was a well-educated and deeply religious man who would later become Prince Bishop of Wamia, a post which he held through four successive Polish monarchs. The wealth and connections that he made through his life meant that he was considered the most powerful man in Wamia. Sadly, not much is known about the very early years of Copernicus's life, but it is fairly safely assumed that his education was of a high standard to prepare for his eventual entrance to the University of Krakow. In 1491, he began at the University of Krakow, where he would formally study painting and mathematical astronomy, but also began privately studying philosophy and natural science. Around these years, he produced his earliest scientific notes. Interestingly, these early notes were lost during a later conflict and taken as part of war booty. They have, however, subsequently been found and relocated to the University of Uppsala in Sweden, with a little loop back to that later. These early years of study at Krakow University allowed Copernicus to develop his reasoning and begin his critical analysis and later discarding of the two leading and at the time official models of the universe, the systems of Aristotle and Ptolemy. Around 1495, Copernicus left Krakow University without a degree as he was headed for the court of his uncle Watsonrode. Now the Prince Bishop of Wamia, Watsonrode had wanted Nicholas to fill a newly vacant post in the Wamia canonry. However, for reasons unclear, Copernicus's installation was delayed. Bishop Watsonrode would then make the decision to send Nicholas to study canon law in Italy, with a view to furthering his ecclesiastic career. Two years later, Nicholas did formally succeed to the Wamia canonry. Around 1496, while in Italy studying canon law as his uncle had bid, Copernicus signed himself up to the University of Bologna, where he would study humanities and astronomy. It's fairly safe to say that during his time in Italy, he didn't study quite as hard as he could have towards completion of his canon law education. He actually only received his doctorate after seven years during a second return to Italy in 1503. Nonetheless, these years at Bologna University, however, would prove to be some of the most important in Nicholas's life, as it was here that he met the famous astronomer Domenico Maria Novara da Ferrara. He'd become his disciple and even assistant. Around this time, he began to develop his new ideas and new doubts about the currently accepted models of the universe, observational experiments such as his observation of the occultation of Aldebaran by the moon on the 9th of March 1497 served to further confirm his growing doubts. By the year 1500, Nicholas and his brother Andrew had travelled to Rome, where he would perform an apprenticeship at the Papal Curia. Happily, however, while there he did continue his astronomical work too, with one notable event being the observation of a lunar eclipse on November the 6th that year. By 1501, Copernicus arrived back in Wamia. He was, however, to almost immediately set back out again in order to study medicine so that, I quote, he may in future be a useful medical advisor to our reverend bishop and the gentlemen of the chapter. So again, returning to Italy, likely accompanied by his brother Andrew, Copernicus would study this time at the University of Padua, where he would largely remain until the summer of 1503. Finally, having completed all of his studies and now at the age of 30, Copernicus returned to Wamia, where he would mostly remain for the next 40 years of his life. Copernicus served his uncle, Prince Bishop Watson Road, in all things and very much was a hands-on part of proceedings learning diplomacy, politics and statesmanship during his work. 
These are skills which would put to use many times throughout his long career. No doubt Copernicus remained active during this time with his astronomical pursuits. However, it wasn't until his uncle's death in 1512 that he would really begin to work on recording his heliocentric theory. Rather pleasantly, I think, before his uncle passed away, Copernicus had completed and submitted for publishing a collection of 85 Greek poems that he'd worked to translate into Latin. He dedicated his version to his uncle in thanks for all the great benefits he had received from him. Moving back to Copernicus's heliocentric model now, the initial outline of his theory was only shared with a few of his closest acquaintances, and over the next decades, while continuing his various jobs and responsibilities, Copernicus would develop and refine his theory ultimately into his magnum opus, De Revolutionibus Orbium Celestium. His greatest work would remain unpublished for many years. Historians disagree as to why exactly Copernicus delayed publication, be it his concerns about potential astronomical, philosophical or religious objections. Whatever the reason, ultimately it was Copernicus's only student, Reticus, who himself was an incredibly talented man, finally convinced him to publish. The wheels were set in motion and off it went to Nuremberg for printing. Interestingly, during the printing process, an unauthorized and unsigned preface was added to the book, acting almost in defense of Copernicus for the ideas shared within his book. However well-meaning it may have been, the fact that it was unsigned could lead someone to believe that Copernicus doubted his own theories and that it looked like he himself could have wrote this preface in that case. However, the edition was later attributed to Andreas Osiander, a Lutheran theologian. By 1543, the book had finally been published. That same year, on the 24th of May, Copernicus died at the age of 70. Legend has it that he was presented with a copy of his book on that last day, allowing him to finally see his life's work completed. He was buried in Frombach Cathedral, where he remains to this day. However, sadly, it has not been without troubles. His grave was defaced and ultimately lost, with multiple efforts being made over the centuries to find him again. It wasn't until August 2005 that the Cathedral Thor was scanned and they believed that they found Copernicus's remains beneath them. Forensic experts reconstructed a face based on the skull that they had found and it closely resembled a Copernicus self-portrait. To add certainty, the DNA from the bones was analysed and matched to hair samples found in some of Copernicus's books, which we mentioned earlier, which were kept at the University of Uppsala in Sweden. In 2008, it was finally announced to the public that it was Indeed, Nicholas Copernicus, and on the 22nd of May 2010, 467 years after his death, he was given a lavish second funeral and was reburied in the same spot that he was found. I hope that you've enjoyed this video and thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you did enjoy it and I look forward to seeing you next time.